thank you so much, Dr. Demartini, for coming on our show. Thank you. So we'd like to ask you about what is the Demartini process? The Demartini method is a series of very specific questions to either ask yourself if you're working on yourself or ask the client if you're working with a client that allows them to see their same perceptions and experiences through different eyes. It allows them to find the hidden order in their daily chaos and it transforms things that they perceive as stressful that has emotional baggage associated with it and turns it back into something they can say thank you for. Something they can see that all the events in their life are on the way, not in the way, instructive, not obstructive, and help people become more masters of their destiny instead of victims of their history. So it's a series of very precise questions that have been used to dissolve fear, uh, shame, guilt, pride, distractions, um, maybe even infatuations, phobias, anything that distracts the mind from being present, inspired, purposeful, and powerful. It's a series of questions that eliminate those emotional baggages and turns people back onto being present and empowered. And you mentioned their um, appreciation or uh, gratitude. Um, how is that linked to um, being able to gain that balance and clarity? Well, by my definition in the program I teach called the Breakthrough Experience, that I say that gratitude is a perfectly equilibrated or balanced mind. If you're infatuated with somebody and you see more support than challenge and you put them on a pedestal, um, that person's going to occupy space and time in your mind and you're going to be distracted by them. If you're resentful to somebody and they challenge you more than support your highest values in your perception, uh, they're going to occupy space and time in your mind and you're not going to be present. But if you balance the equation and don't put them on pedestals or don't put them on pits and just put them in your heart, you're, the second you balance your mind, gratitude comes out. And gratitude is the key that opens up the gateway of the heart and allows love to come out. So I always say that when you have a balanced mind, you have a grateful heart. It opens your heart to love. When you have love come out, it window washes the mind, allows you to be inspired, and allows your body to be enthused. When you put gratitude and love of the heart, inspiration of the mind, enthusiasm of the body in place, um, you're the most productive, most, most uh, powerful person you can be. And whether it be in business or whether it be in your personal life, you're a more effective person doing what you love when you're in that state. And so with um, applying the value determination um, process, um, because there are always people that we um, aspire to be like, how can we improve ourselves through applying that? Well, the value determination process is a method that I use in many areas. I use it in education in different parts of the world, uh, government leadership, corporate leadership, um, whether it be in relationship communication, social leadership, doesn't matter. What happens is every human being lives by a set of priorities, a set of values, things that are most important to least important in their life. Whenever they set goals that are congruent and aligned with their highest values, they become the most powerful and effective people they can be. This is when they're the most grateful, the most resilient. This is when they're most disciplined and most fulfilled in their life. Whenever they're living by lower values and trying to inject the values of others or minimize uh, themselves and live by lower value systems, they procrastinate, hesitate, frustrate, and they become, you might say, victims of their history, not masters of their destiny. So the value determination process is a 13-step questionnaire that I have developed to help people identify what's truly important to them. What does their life demonstrate? Because your life demonstrates what's valuable, and if you ask somebody what's valuable to them, they, they'll usually give something that's not uh, exactly concise, but by doing this process, it gets concise. And once you set goals that are congruent with that, that's when the magic begins. So you look at how people fill their space, you look at how they spend their time, you look at what they are disciplined about and focused on, you look at where they're most organized, you look at where they spend the most money, you look at what energizes them the most, you look at what they think about, visualize, affirm, and converse with others about most that is, is in line with what they're creating in life. You look at what they're inspired by, what their goals are, and what they love learning. If you look and find the common threads to those questions, It'll narrow down to what you're dedicated to and what you spontaneously can't wait to get up in the morning and do. So the value determination process that I developed is designed to help people get concise and clear on what their mission is and what they're dedicated to. Fantastic. And so in applying um, these principles, um, particularly for business owners who aspire to success, uh, what are the key things that you think are you know, key to being able to achieve success? Well, any individual that is setting goals, intentions, that are congruent and aligned with the highest values, they have the highest probability of being spontaneously inspired in the morning to get up and do it. So if you have an entrepreneur 
um, that's working in a business and they found what is most meaningful to them, they have found uh, the tap dance to work energy that Warren Buffett describes. Um, as Bill Pollack, who owns Drake Corporation, told me, he says, uh, since 1951, since I found out what I love doing, I've never worked a day since. Um, so that is the highest value. Now, in addition to that, an entrepreneur also has to find out what their targeted market's highest values are to make sure that they're providing a service that meets those specific needs. So determining your own values and determining other people's values that you want to serve uh, is an essential component because you're here to be able to find something that serves other people, but it's also meaningful to you. If you find those two, you've got your niche. Now you've got exactly what you would love to get up in the morning and do, and you get to, you get to go and do what exactly people want, and you get to fulfill their life. I always say when you can't wait to get up in the morning and do what you love to do, people can't wait to get your service. So in business, determining the person's values and linking everything that they do in their daily job description towards those values. So one of the greatest questions we ever ask ourselves is, how is whatever I'm doing today help me fulfill what's most meaningful to me? If you link whatever you're doing on a daily basis in the job description to whatever's highest on your value, you will end up more engaged, more productive, more inspired. Um, you will not take as many breaks. You won't even need breaks because you're engaged in what you're doing and love what you do. And so on the topic of motivation and drive, um, because a lot of business experts say that we need um, a why. Um, it's either something that moves us away from either pain or pulls us toward pleasure. Um, what's your approach toward you know, drive and motivation? Well, the, the difference between my teachings and motivational teachings, uh, because I have different differences in there. When a person, because everybody has a set of priorities, a set of values in their life, whenever they're living by their highest value, which the ancient Greeks called the telos, which is the highest priority in their life. The chief aim, as Napoleon Hill called it, or the Ed, Ed Ellison called it the magnificent obsession, or the big why. That highest value uh, is, is the most meaningful and most purposeful thing they can do. That is the purpose. When you do, you're the most resilient, most adaptable to pain and pleasure. When you go down the list of values to lower values, um, you're less inspired, less fulfilled by doing them. You procrastinate in doing them. And what happens is you'll only do them if it's pleasurable, and if it's not, you'll give up. So it's a key is to make sure that everything you do is, is highest priority, the thing that's most meaningful to you, so you don't give up, you have the resilience, and you embrace pain and pleasure in the pursuit of a great purpose. If you are not living by your highest values because you're wanting to do it with pleasure only and you'll want to give up if it's pain, uh, you'll need motivation all the time. The difference between inspiration, which is from within, is people who are inspired from within are living by their highest values. And people that need motivation from without are people that haven't found that highest value and are living by lower values, and they need constant incentives and motivation and only pleasure to keep them going. So I'm not a motivational speaker, and I don't promote motivation because I think motivation is a symptom more than a solution. Finding out what's highest on a person's values, finding out what inspires them from within, transcends the need for motivation. It's really quite fascinating that distinction there because often we do look for you know, quick fixes for motivation to pull us up. But that's a totally different way of looking at that. Well, the animal is always having an impulse for that which is prey and pleasure and an instinct away from that which is pain and predator. So our animal nature needs motivation. But our truest nature, our human nature, the one that activates the, the telencephalon in the brain, the executive centers of the brain, which allows you to be an executive and a leader in the world, uh, transcends this pain, pleasure, amygdala reaction of the lower animal within us and allows us to function from an inner core mission that transcends that and allows us to be able to embrace pain, pleasure, support, challenge, ease, difficulties, any complementary pair of opposites that you face along the way, you turn into on the way. So living by inspiration is far more powerful than needing motivation. You're famous um, for, for saying that um, you know, sometimes when, when we are disappointed it's because we do have unrealistic expectations. How can we differentiate between unrealistic expectations versus creating like, high standards for ourselves that we can aspire to? Well, an unrealistic expectation is something that you're expecting to do that's something that defies the laws of the universe. If you're expecting to float across the, the, between two buildings, uh, that's unrealistic expectation. Or if you're expecting yourself to do something that's truly not high on your values and not meaningful to you, you'll tend to give up. Uh, or expecting some other human being to do something that doesn't abide by the laws of the universe. Or expecting them to live outside their values. Because every human being makes decisions according to what will give them the greatest advantage over disadvantage, greatest reward over risk to their highest values. So if you expect yourself to do something that's not really meaningful to you, it sounds like a neat whim, but it's not really you, you're going to end up self-defeating and end up with the A, B, C, Ds of negativity. 
internal anger and aggression, internal blame and feelings of betrayal, internal criticism and challenge, internal despondency, despair and depression. And these ABCDs of negativity that you internally have, which some people call negative self-talk and negative self-behavior, is actually a feedback mechanism to make sure we're setting realistic expectations that are aligned with our real values. And we know that it's real if we can see it in our mind's eye, we see the strategy, we know the action steps, and it's obtainable. Now those are the keys. When you do, you have a realistic expectation and you keep showing effort and evidence of manifesting what you want to manifest. So in applying that to goal setting, for example, um, what tips do you have for creating goals that you know, do push us you know, beyond our comfort zone, um, but at the same time we know that we can achieve? Well, I always say, it, and I just got through mentioning this uh, in an interview, uh, the wisest thing to do is start with simple goals that you achieve and train yourself to do what you say. If you train yourself to do what you say, your piggy banks become biggie banks. Your little action steps become big dreams. And if you live congruently with your highest values, you have the highest probability of achievement and you won't give up on your goals. So if you set goals that are congruent, that are truly meaningful to you, and you start chunking them down into small enough bites, so you just keep doing things and keep rewarding yourself by accomplishing immediate steps, you'll end up manifesting things because you just strategize your way into the bigger game. So I always say that if you chunk the big project down into small bites and then down to everything that's within a time horizon and within your vision to see and do, you'll get it. You just stay with it long enough. If you stay perseverant towards an objective and exemplify action every day towards your objective, sooner or later everybody else kind of dies out and you're at the top. You just got to stay with it. Never give up on a vision. Yeah. And what about um, procrastination? Do you think that by applying that, that would eliminate procrastination or does it Well, procrastination is a result of three primary things. It's an unclear vision. It is an unchunked vision. It means you're taking on too big a chunk without bringing it down to small enough bites that you can go and get it done. Uh, and it's not linked to your highest values. If you take the, the objective that you have, you make sure it is abide by the laws of the universe, so it's doable. Um, you make sure it really matches your highest values so it's linked. And the way you know that is if you can rattle off the reasons why you can do it and how it will help you fulfill your mission fluently. But if you're fluent, you're congruent. Then you basically make sure it's chunked down to small action steps you can do and you micromanage until you've proven you can macromanage. That means you do it into small baby steps every single day. This, if I do this, I'm one step closer. If I do this the next day, I do it one step closer. Break it down into such small steps that it's a, by the inch it's a cinch. If you do, you won't procrastinate. Procrastinate means that you've unchunked it, unlinked it, and unclarified it. On the topic of fear um, and pushing ourselves beyond our comfort zone, uh, what tips do you have for you know, pushing ourselves so that we can achieve things that we normally are quite fearful of approaching? Well, anytime you're setting a goal that is not congruent with your highest values, you're more vulnerable to fear because you're looking for pleasure. And anytime you're looking for a pleasure without a pain, you have a fantasy. And every fantasy uh, creates a nightmare. And the nightmare is the compensation. I always say that your phobias are a result of your philias. And if you're setting up a goal that has got a pleasure without a pain, you're going to end up having a pain without a pleasure as a result as a fear. Uh, a person who's smart with goals will know, they will go and look at their goal, they'll know that there'll be pain and pleasure in the pursuit of it, because anybody who sets a goal, by the time they get the goal, they thought, God, I didn't know I was going to run into all this. The person who plans out all the pains and pleasures and all the, 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 the opportunities and challenges that might happen and preempts them and thinks them through and come up with contingency plans so no matter what happens, they're prepared. They're the person that reduces the fear zone because they've set up not fantasies of a pleasure without a pain, but they know the pains of what it's going to take to pursue it. They prepared it. They've got contingencies in place. They've got their strategies in place. They act on it. So if you have a goal and you've got a big enough reason for something and you've thought out your plan, you reduce the probability of having phobias and pains. And in applying that to business and taking on risks um, in business, how can we um, know whether, I guess, to approach certain decisions, uh, whether the risk might be like a realistic fear or an unrealistic fear? Well, usually a risk is a symptom of not doing your planning and not doing your invest investigation. You're going out there half finished with your, 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 your expiration of the thing. Uh, I was sitting there, I, we used to live in Trump Tower, and we came down the, the, the tower one time with Donald, my wife and I. And uh, we, we met down in the lobby and we were walking down to the corner of the street on 56th and 5th and then across the street. He had 12 people with him. And we listened to him converse with those 12 people and they were doing the Hudson River project at the time. And uh, what's interesting is, is he was asking them to find everything that could ever go wrong on this project. 
So one person was dedicated to utilities. Anything that could be damaged by the utilities, they start digging and building a foundation where they run into wires, are they going to go into pipes, are they going to go into sewage? Every single thing that could go wrong, they wanted to have and find out in advance what could possibly be there and what are the contingency plans. And he wanted 12 contingency plans for every one of those obstacles. So he basically thought through those things, planned those things, wasn't into just positive thinking, because I think that's superficial. I think you need to have balanced thinking, know both sides, have a preparation for both sides. That's a true strategy. When you do, you don't have fears. You get into action. You don't procrastinate as much. Um, you don't let the emotions or the distractions uh, do it. You just follow your steps and follow and execute your plans. People that have clear plans like that, they get their outcomes. So you did uh, touch on positive thinking. Um, I guess with, with the idea of positive thinking, do you think that that is an element of success or is it um, a complete uh, sort of myth? I think it's a myth. I, I think that people who think they're going to be positive all the time are delusioned. I think that uh, I did a research project many years ago where I took the 300 best-selling books on positive thinking. I went through each of those books one page at a time, identified the most positive words in the positive language that I could find in there, which 2,000 words I found. I put them on index cards. I then meditated and thought of a positive affirmation or quotation for each of those words. I then put that into a book and divided it into 365 days, so there were five to six positive affirmations and quotations per day. I then recited them 108 times a day, so that's 600 affirmations on average per day. I kept record of that and I monitored that with a form which I call the day-by-day -day cycle forecasting form. And I monitored spiritually, mentally, career, financial, family, social, and physical areas of life literally four times a day, seven in the morning, 11, three, and seven. And I basically, as I'm affirming these 600 quotations throughout the, every day for two years, 24 months I did this, basically monitoring what were my emotional reactions and physical reactions in each of the seven areas of life. Was I inspired or was I despired? Was I, was I focused? Was I scattered? Was I feeling successful or failure? Did I feel like I was uh, wealthy or poor? Did I feel close and intimate to my spouse or maybe distant? Did I feel outgoing and extroverted or introverted? Did I feel vital and energized or I feel poor and sick? I monitored it throughout the day, four times a day, every day, six aff affirmations. At the end of that two-year period, I then totaled up all the scores on a plus three to minus three scale. I monitored it. I found out that I had ups, downs, up, up, down, down, up, down, up, down. A total amount is zeroed out. So I realized it was delusional to think I was going to be a one-sided person. Just like a magnet, it has two sides, and you have two sides. And the more you set up a fantasy that has only one side, the more you get depressed when it doesn't match your fantasy. So I'm a realistic guy that sets real goals in real time uh, with a balanced orientation, and I accomplish more by doing that than setting up fantasies and then having nightmares. So I'm not a positive thinking guy. I'm a balanced thinking guy. But when people are down, I, that you need the positive thinking. But when you're, when you're up and you're fantasizing and setting up fantasies and pies in the skies, you need some critical thinking to be able to put you back into reality. So I'm a believer in both sides are needed. And in applying that to entrepreneurship, because um, you know, running your own business is quite a roller coaster, uh, what, how do we approach then um, the negatives, you know, particularly stress? Well, I would say stress is the inability to adapt to a changing environment, which means usually that you're exaggerating and minimizing yourself throughout the day. Uh, so what I did is I did a number of steps. One of them is at the end of the day, I would stop. And if I had this super high day and really thought I'd really had done something and really was puffed up and kind of proud, I'd ask, who did I forget to serve today? Who did I not call? What procedure did I not follow? Um, what name did I overlook? What, pr what priority did I not uh, hit today? Um, I would ask questions that learn to self-govern myself back down into the center. And if I had a low day and I really thought, wow, what a real crazy day, I would ask, what did I accomplish? Who did I serve? What names did I remember? I would self-regulate because I realized that if I didn't self-monitor myself, the world had to. If I didn't govern myself, the world governs me. So I would neutralize myself and steady myself. And instead of having volatilities in my business, I had steadiness. I also forced in savings. I didn't wait for profits. I forced profits in. I paid myself first. I built up a big cash res reserve. So it decreases the volatility. It increases the client quality that I had. It increases the associations opportunities and al alignments to greater opportunities in business. I made sure that I focused on the priorities each day, delegating lower priority things on a regular basis, because if I was going to do low priority things, I was going to keep myself in a low priority position. And today I do research, write, travel, teach. Everything else is delegated away. I don't do anything else. So I learned to delegate, prioritize, delegate, 
and free myself up to do what I do best according to my highest values where I have the most resilience. You're very well known for being featured in The Secret. Um, how can we apply the law of attraction and some of those principles um, in order to build a successful career? Well, the real principle behind the law of attraction is not really metaphysical as some would like to propose. Um, although it seems to be because we don't understand the laws behind them. But if you look very carefully, if you set a goal, uh, well, let's, let's step back. If you're a woman and you're dedicated to children and you have three beautiful children and you walk in a mall, you're going to notice things related to children. You're not going to notice business materials. But if you're an entrepreneur and you're walking in a mall, you're going to notice business things. You're not going to notice children's things. So that means that whatever is most important to you, whatever is highest on your value, whatever your real purpose and most inspiration is, you're going to filter out of your reality. You're going to see opportunities. You're going to make decisions quicker because you've got more awareness. And you're going to stick to them with more perseverance in that area. And you're going to see more synchronicities. So a lot of the secret is simply those things that occur spontaneously when you're congruent with your highest values. Because so many people came up to me at the thing and I said, well, the secret didn't work for me. And when we looked and analyzed what was going on, it's because they set goals that weren't aligned to who they are. They set up fantasies from injected values of other people, tried to be somebody they weren't, set up fantasies that were not realistic. Like one lady came and said, I went out to my mailbox and I expected a million dollar check. I did it every day for three months and there was never a million dollar check. I suggested that she go out and try to get a job and do home work. But she had a fantasy. So those type of things undermine the power of the mind. So if a person will set goals that are congruent and aligned, and chunk them down and follow those actions and prioritize it and delegate that, they have amazing synchronicities and their vision and their affirmations and their things become congruent and, and in that congruency they create their reality. So I'm a believer that it's not as much metaphysical as it is axiological. It is based on human value systems. Now you've worked with very high net worth individuals such as businessmen, um, celebrities and even athletes. Uh, what are you, I guess, what are the lessons that have been um, key to success and, and wealth creation? Well, I think that the first step is to dissolve your own shames and guilts and reasons why you don't deserve. Because a lot of people are sitting there beating themselves up. Anytime you set goals that are not aligned with your highest values and you then don't achieve because you give up on them, then you end up beating yourself up and think there's something wrong with you. Well, first of all, you want to find out whatever you've done in your life, how it served you, how it served others, and clear out any shame and guilt. Then you want to sit down and, and ask, what is it that you're really going to do? Because you're not going to get wealthy unless you're serving people. And if you're not dedicated to serving people, you have a fantasy called wealth. You need to make sure that you really have a value on serving people. You need to have a value on wealth, because if you don't really have a value on wealth, you'll spend it. If you have more of a value on spending it than saving it and investing it, it's going to keep going out the window. Because the money circulates through the economy from those who value at least to those who value it most over time. So you have to value wealth building more than spending. You have to value serving people more than just taking. And you have to be able to, to uh, be dedicated to something that's really congruent with your values or you won't stay with it. You won't build momentum and perseverance towards the accomplishment. And people who have a forced automatic savings in place and are willing to consistently study and research because they value wealth building, uh, Warren Buffett spent, uh, was by the time he was 11, he already read all the books in the Omaha, Nebraska library on wealth building by the age of 11. He was committed to the outcome. People are really committed to wealth building. They study it, they research it, they mentor under it, they apply it, they have forced savings and investment structures in place. They constantly are trying to serve people and they want to build a business that lasts. At the age of 14, um, you left school uninspired by academia at the time um, and were even diagnosed with dyslexia. Um, how did you? turn your life around, um, was there a key moment that um, led you to that decision? Well, when I was uh, seven years old, my teacher told me in front of my parents that I would never be able to read or write or communicate, never mount a thing, never go very far in life. When I, um, I made it through elementary school with the help of the smartest kids. I befriended them and kept asking them questions about the class and about the text that they were reading, etc. And um, I made it through there until my parents moved to Richmond, Texas, out in the country. And there, there weren't any smart kids, and I lived way out in the country, and I was in a low socioeconomic area, and I ended up uh, eventually failing and dropping out of school. So I then started living on the streets when I was a teenager. And uh, it was great. I had street smarts. I learned how to, you know, ask for what I wanted and bum and pay, beg and panhandle and all kind of stuff and do odd jobs, whatever it would take. And um, so that was my, my teenage years. At 17, I found myself by then, um, first in California, then in Hawaii, surfing and I was living in a tent, and um, I nearly died uh, for strychnine poisoning. And I, luckily, a lady found me in a tent and led me to a little health food store, which led me to a little evening class by Paul Bragg. 
And um, one night, in one hour, one man with one message um, shifted my life and helped me determine what I wanted to do. At the time, I didn't ever think I could be intelligent. But after listening to this man speak, he made me believe that just maybe, maybe someday I could be intelligent. So that night, I had a dream to learn how to read, learn how to, to be smart, learn how to be intelligent, and try to be a teacher. Well, that was the beginning. That was 41 years ago. And that was the turning point. And I eventually started to fast. I started to uh, live differently, eat differently. Uh, I went back and got my first book and tried to learn how to read. I eventually started reading dictionaries. I mean, I, I just changed my life. I, I used to read literally 18 to 20 hours a day reading dictionaries and encyclopedias to try to catch up with all the other kids. And today, I'm, uh, I guess you could say I'm a scholar. I've read over 29,000, almost 30,000 books. And I constantly read every single day. I, I always say that uh, if, you, if you know what your service is, uh, you gain specialized knowledge in it, uh, you're willing to speak out and share your message because those are the mission to have a message, you're willing to sell your ideas in a way where it helps people get what they want in life, and you're willing to save and invest in yourself, the world will invest with you. Wow, that's really inspiring. Now you talked about um, self-education. Um, is that essential to success, do you think? Well, I think if you haven't found out what you're so inspired, See, people love learning what is most meaningful to them. And if you're doing what's most meaningful to them, you can't wait to learn. So self-learning is, is a spontaneous, emergent phenomenon inside every human being who finds what is really meaningful to them and is congruent with that. And once they set sail and set goal on that, they become captain of the ship, master of their destiny. They can't wait to get up and learn and read and study. They can't wait to be of service. They can't wait to go out and make a difference because they're here to do extraordinary things. And when they're congruent, that's what happens. Now you've previously stated, and I quote, being a master of persistence means embracing both support and challenge in the pursuit of your dreams. What do you mean by this? Well, as I said, if you live by your highest values, you're willing to embrace both pain and pleasure in the pursuit. When somebody's doing something that's really, 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 truly meaningful to them, that means so much to them, they won't give up on it. Even if there's challenges, they take it on. Even if there's difficulties, they take it on. Even if there's pains, they keep going. When I, when I was with uh, Nick Lowry, who's a Hall of Famer football kicker in, in Phoenix, Arizona, not too long ago, he's one of the greatest football guys ever in the world. I mean, he kicked, he's the greatest kicker ever lived. And um, he had broken bones and damaged knees and this and that. Nothing stopped him. His mission was to be the greatest football player. So when somebody's inspired by a vision and they're inspired by their, what they want to accomplish and they know their service and they know what their mission is, they embrace pain and pleasure in pursuit of it support and challenge, ease and difficulty, all complementary opposite pairs that we face in life, uh, nice, mean, kind, cruel, hero, villain, whatever pair of opposites there are, we embrace them both and we live by our highest value. But the second we go down to lower values, we only want one side. And people that want one side end up bipolar. Bipolar is a byproduct, bipolar condition is a byproduct of un, uh, what do you call it, uh, the search for one side, monopolar uh, expectations. As long as you're looking for a one-sided world, always positive, always sweet, always positive, always kind, always nice, always sweet, that, that's delusional. I don't, I don't support that kind of illusion because no one ever has that. People live in a fantasy. The fastest way to be depressed is look for only one side. The fastest way to fail is to look for only one side. Embrace both sides of life and you'll be prepared for the real, the real challenges that you face to do incredible things in the world. The, the people that do the most extraordinary things embrace both sides. And talking about both sides, the polar opposites, should we choose um, like a small handful of values that we aspire to become on one end? Um, is, is there too many that we end up spreading ourselves too thin? Well, you have a natural set of values already, automatically. Even babies, when they're born, already have a set of values. They're already drawn to certain things and are repelled from certain things. So it's not that you need to select them necessarily, but you already have them. Now, there's only two ways to having fulfillment. Either you set goals that match the highest values, or you change the values to match the goals you say. So if, if I go and I, I stand in front of thousands of people and I ask, how many of you want to be financial independent? Everybody puts their hand up. But when I ask how many are, most everybody puts their hand down. One percent or less actually make financial independence. But 100 percent of the hands go up. So that means 99 percent of the people are living in a delusion. And if you ask them what are they going to do if I gave them 10 million dollars, what would they do with their life? I guarantee you, two to eight million, I've done it thousands of times, Two to eight million of that will be spent in less than a minute. If you ask them what would they do if they had $10 million, they'd write down all the things. They'd buy that car, they'd buy that trip, they'd buy this. And it was all consumers, all depreciables, all de devaluing. As long as they spend their money on depreciables and consumables, they really don't have a real desire for building wealth. They have to invest it and buy things that appreciate value if they want to be wealthy. And people who don't have those values aren't going to get there. 
So you either have to shift the values and stair step the values up and have a higher value on wealth building if you want that, or you're setting yourself up for the ABCDs and negativity, expecting yourself to get something that's not going to happen. What is your um, definition of confidence and applying confidence to success? Well, anytime you set a goal that's going to be congruent, aligned with your highest values, you're going to have certainty. You're going to get confidence because you're not going to give up on it. You'll get your jo job done. You have the highest probability of achievement, and you have the greatest certainty. Uh, anytime you set a goal that's lower on your values, you're going to have the highest probability of not achieving it. Your uncertainty is going to be there. You're not going to have confidence. You're going to set up whims to compensate for the unfulfillment, and you end up setting yourself up for nightmares. So the key is identifying what's truly important to you, prioritizing your life, sticking to the ABCs, not going to the XYZs, delegating those, and getting on with what's truly most meaningful to you. There have been certain individuals that have been known to defy um, human physics, like for example, not eating um, or drinking for 70 years. Is that because they um, have that self-belief and are so committed to achieving something? Well, first of all, the great number of the people that have been supposedly doing that were found to be frauds. So I want to make sure that that's not uh, over-exaggerated because very few people have gone long periods of time. I've gone 35 days without food with just drinking water. I know that's doable. But people have done 40 days and 60 days and things like this. 70 years, the one gentleman that they found, it was an Indian gentleman that they thought had done 70 days, uh, was found to have a recycling of his cerebral spinal fluid through the top of his, his uh, uh, palate and through into his nostrils, uh, was recycling cerebral fluid and was getting fluid in. So um, we sometimes have to make sure that it's real and legit, because there's lots of stories out there on breatharians and people that do all kinds of things but you actually have to put them under supervision and put them under scrutiny to find out if they're true. A great number of them are not true. The few that have gone long periods of time, um, it's not just because of discipline, it's because they've brought their metabolic rates down to such low levels that they do not require a tremendous amount of food concentration. They've somehow recycled whatever they are consuming and they're basically in a mindset that's transcendent in moderating their whole metabolic physiology. Usually they're going to be yogis that know how to regulate their physiology. But I don't know of anybody that's successfully and been proven to go 70 years. Nobody's done a study on somebody that long. I think the longest one is, is much shorter than that. It was done here in Sydney, Australia, actually. So in achieving success, um, because you know, be, I guess being an entrepreneur or a business owner does require an unconventional um, lifestyle, do you think that we can defy um, you know, traditional sort of physics in that sense with the power of the mind? Uh, I don't think we defy any uh, laws of physics with the mind. I think what we do is we have learned more and more over the years about how the mind works and the physics of it. So I don't think there's any defiance of any physics laws. I think what it is is that we just are learning more about how it works. I mean, just recently they found out that there's molecules that are basically a pheromonic that are basically released from the cells in the skin. They go out and release and are actually able to influence a group of people. So that means that you can actually sense through molecules what emotion somebody else is having. Now, they didn't know that occurred until recently. So when you're in a room, you can have a sense for other people and sense what they're feeling and intuitively guess that. But now we found out that that's been actually traced to molecules. They just recently found out we have other senses that we didn't realize. And we just found out that, that we can cross sense. We have a gestalt uh, inner sense uh, mechanism. So as we learn more and more about the brain and the physiology, the, a lot of the mystical components of it start dropping away. And um, I've been fascinated by mysticism, philosophy, theology, and, and uh, the yogis for many years. I've been a yogi for 41 years. So I've been fascinated by that. But a great number of them have been exaggerated claims. The wisest thing to do is start with the basics, start with some reality, and keep expanding what we learn and keep growing. Um, I always say it's just like in theology, we, we, we think there's a mystery and then we eventually solve the mystery, go on to the next mystery. So I'd rather not say that it's outside the laws of physics, I'd just say that we haven't learned all the physics laws. And having such an incredible background in academia as well as philosophy, um, do you have uh, one particular truth or several truths that are really key to you, you know, what, what you believe in? Well. If, if, person, if you've never been to the breakthrough experience, it may not make sense, but in the breakthrough experience, I, in the, by using the Demartini method, we actually ask a series of questions that help you see a hidden order in life. Now this hidden order is there, but most people don't see it because they keep filtering their reality through their values and they keep uh, distorting their reality through generalizations. Uh, just like if you're infatuated with somebody, you're blind to the downsides. If you're resentful, you're blind to the upsides. As long as you're blind with emotions, you don't see what's actually there. And what's actually there is really profound. And I always say that the, that the synthesis and synchronicity of all complementary opposites is love. Mm -hmm. 
true love, not the fantasy love and infatuation most people claim, but a true love. And my observation, now working with a quarter of a million people in the breakthrough experience, that there is nothing but love. All else is illusion. And that's not metaphysical. It's demonstrable, reproducible. Uh, I do it every weekend in the breakthrough experience. And so I think that that's the most profound principle that we have, that, that everything that goes on in our life is a feedback mechanism to help us realize that we're here to be grateful and to love, because that's the essence of our existence. And how does that apply to, to business then? Well, if you're doing what you love, it was Peter Lynch in his one up on Wall Street back in the 90s, he said, if you're grateful for your job, if you love what you're doing, you're inspired by the vision and you're enthusiastically working, that company's going up in value. And if you're going to buy stock, buy a stock that you visited the company and see those four things. If those four things are in place, the company's going to go up in value because that's four things that exemplify what's possible and draw and magnetize charismatically people to people who are doing those four things. A company can't grow uh, without those four things. And is that the formula for business success? Well, there's many components of business success, that's, but as far as human behavioral components and human resource components, if, if people are not engaged, in a, a study in Japan, they found out that the average factory worker was engaged 20% of the time, and the CEO is around 75% of the time, and the owner is about 80% of the time. And um, the, the more engaged you are, the more productive you are. And so if you have a whole bunch of people that are not engaged in your company, the company's not going to do well. You have to have them engaged. And the way they're engaged, the way of knowing they're engaged, is how well they can answer the question, how is this job description helping you fulfill what's most meaningful in your life? If they can't see the connection, they're not engaged. But once they see how whatever they're doing and the vision of the company is connected to their highest values, that engagement level goes skyrocketing and the productivity goes up. And when people are productive and they feel that it's, it's important that what they're doing, they feel an ownership and a pride in their workmanship. So is that the first step um, when it comes to being a leader in, is um, engaging your team in a vision? Well, the first thing you do is you get clear about your own mission and make sure you're congruent because exemplification is still the greatest teacher as a leader. Then you have to realize that you're going to have supporters and challenges within the company. They're going to represent disowned parts of you. So they're going to be reminding you of what you haven't owned in yourself. So you have to own everything. You have to be hero and villain, saint and sinner, virtuous and vicious if you want to lead a company. Then you have to make sure that when you're hiring, you've got to be really clear on what the job description is so it's not a fake. And you want to make sure that when you hire people, you ask them, how is this job duty going to help you fulfill your values? If they can't see it, don't hire them because they're not going to be engaged. You're going to have a theory X component from McGregor if all of a sudden you don't have somebody engaged. They're going to need motivation, incentives. They're going to be asking for time off. They're going to want to break coffee breaks, tea breaks, fat breaks, sugar breaks, sick breaks. Those are all symptoms which require motivation. That's why I say motivation is not a solution, it's a symptom. But if you have somebody who's engaged and they can see how what they're going to do in their job is going to help them fulfill their highest values, they can't wait to go to work and they don't even care about breaks. They don't want to take a, a coffee break or a tea break. They don't want stimulants because it interferes with their productivity. And on a slightly different topic, um, you've worked with so many um, business owners. Where do you think good business ideas come from? I think that when a person knows what their values are and they're really inspired to go and fulfill their values, their creativity and their genius is born. And if they care enough about humanity, because people who go out and achieve, they get more and more and more engaged in serving other people. And so when people feel successful, they feel confident enough as a leader to want to go make a difference in people's lives, and they give themselves permission to do it. And so they care enough to care, care about what the people need. So they look for problems in the world. And the bigger the problems, the bigger the opportunities in business. So tell me where the biggest problems are in the world and what people are struggling with and challenged by and missing. I always say that it's a mystery that needs to be solved, a problem that needs to be solved, a void that needs to be filled, a chaos that needs to be ordered, uh, some solution needs to be brought in there. But a person who really cares about humanity finds the solutions, finds the answers, finds how to bring the, the needs to people, etc. When they do, business is going to boom because they care enough about people. So it does come down to values. Um, Always values. Yeah. Value. Out of all the studies I've done, 287 different disciplines, axiology, the study of values and worth, is the most crucial study that I know. I've just finished a book this week. It's coming out with Penguin Books on the values factor. And it's the most crucial topic that they will have in business because human beings are not here to be motivated. They're here to be inspired from within. And when they live by their highest values, that's what happens. That's when they're most productive. That's when they're a genius in the mind, productive at work, that's when they get the greatest self-worth, 
That's when they end up communicating most effectively what they love. That when, that's when they wake up their leadership. That's when their health is most vital and energized. And that's when they're most inspired by a vision. Now that's really incredible because I guess many, many people are always struggling with that chase of, you know, chasing um, a dream and, you know, fighting with procrastination and all of those other elements. But if they can just align the, themselves. Look, if a person's procrastinating about what they say they want to do, they think it's, anytime you say something important and you need to be reminded to do it, it's not it. You haven't found it. I, I see this every day in my programs. People come to me and say, I, I keep procrastinating, I keep doing it. I, for, for probably a decade, I asked audiences to write down the number one question they had, just out of curiosity. The number one question is, how do I stay focused? I must have asked a million people that. That was the number one question, how to stay focused. Which means that most people are subordinating to other people, comparing their lives to other people, trying to live other people's lives, instead of living authentically according to their highest values inside. The moment you do, you don't need motivation, you don't procrastinate, you get on with what's priority. But when you expect yourself to live outside your values, you're going to procrastinate. When you expect yourself to be somebody you're not. Emerson said, envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide. You don't want to be trying to be somebody you're not, you want to be yourself. The most powerful you'll ever be is you. Uh, I always say that there's no fantasy out there that will compete with a real you. Do you believe that there is um, a, a real you or do you have that power to create that? Well, you can change your values. Your highest value is your identity. What, if your mother, if you're dedicated to raising three beautiful children and you're your mother, that's who you are. That's your identity. But if you're now, if all of a sudden your children were killed for some accident and you had your husband leave you or die in that accident and you now had to go and create a business, your values would shift. Now you became a businesswoman. So your values will shift throughout your life and your values will determine your destiny. So your identity will be your highest value at all times. So yeah, you can change your identity. I was a baseball player up until I was about 12 to 13. Then, um, then things changed and I became a surfer until age 17, 18. And I faded out of that into, into a scholar and I've been now teaching for 41 years. And who knows what it'll be after this, but most likely I'm, this is what I'll do to the end. And so just one last question, uh, what are your values and you know, what's, what's your purpose? Uh, I research every day, I write every day, I travel every day, I teach every day, I'm a teacher. I can't wait to get up in the morning and do that. I do three, five, 350 to 400 speeches, 426 speeches one year. I do about 1,000 interviews a year. Uh, this is what I love doing. Uh, most people look at my schedule, they go nuts, they go, how does a human being do that? But when you're doing something you love to do, you just do it. You just, it's what you love doing. So I, I'm, uh, I'm a teacher. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Demartini. It's an honor to be able to speak with you. No, thank you for, for the great questions.